Welcome to Pathways to Greatness, where we explore the journeys of exceptional individuals who have achieved remarkable success in their fields. Whether you're an aspiring athlete, a business leader, or simply someone striving to reach your full potential, this podcast is your guide to unlocking the greatness within you. Join us as we dive into inspiring stories, practical strategies, and the mindset shifts that can transform your path to greatness. Let's embark on this journey together. Well, welcome everyone to the Pathways to Greatness podcast, and in today's episode, Roy Dockery joins me, and this is a fantastic show. One of the reasons why is we got started, and we went 20 minutes before I even introduced him on the show, and I knew I was going to do this anyways, so I'll have a little more formal introduction of Roy Dockery, and um, again, it was a great great conversation. So Roy Dockery is the author of The Art of Leading, Truth, Love, and Empathy in Action. He's a problem advisor, a transformative initiator, and he is a coach, a mentor, an executive. He has wonderful information around leadership and the things that you should do. And what's great is it's not theoretical. It's things that he talks about that he has learned through reading, through research, through real world examples. This guy has lived it. He has put the things that he's learned into practice. So it's not just theory. And I'll tell you, a lot of people out there read this information and they're great marketers because they're able to share really good information, but they've never put it into play themselves or even importantly, they don't do it in their personal life. They know it, but they don't practice it. And when when you hear him, you know that he's authentic. You know that he is practicing what he's preaching. So it was a great conversation. This one went even a little longer than I normally like to go, but I didn't want to cut it off because there was so much, and I actually rushed through some of it. So Be very well aware that you will probably see Roy on the show again um, in the near future because there is a lot of valuable information and I enjoyed it. And as we've talked about with this show, as I started this show, not just to share information to everyone who listens, but for me to learn and for me to be enriched and grow through the conversations that I have here. So without further ado, Roy Dockery. Roy, welcome. It's uh, I know we just had a long conversation, so it's <laughs> always that awkward now, the podcast starts conversation, but um, thank you for joining me today. No problem. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, you, you got to make sure you, you, you cut out, right? You got to, got to transition. So it's hard to go from the, from the welcome to the actual introduction, but no, glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And like we were talking about, we were connected through a mutual friend, Kenji, and he's just, he's a wonderful guy. He's got a fantastic heart, and um, I'm I'm grateful that he connected us. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I was telling you before, I've known Kenji for quite a while. So he, I mean, you you met him in his transition to Florida, which he was working for a company that I was leading at the time, and he was leaving a company that I was previously leading. So he was kind of following me from one company to the other one. But yeah, but I actually met Kenji at a you know at a concert that I was throwing in Colorado, probably almost 10 years ago now. Uh, so, and he's just kind of stayed in touch. We stayed in touch on, you know, on LinkedIn and, and on Facebook. And so as he's kind of wor- walked through his career and got into IT and wanting to do some other things, uh, I just posted some jobs that were open. He applied. And then when he got hired, he didn't realize I was the vice president of the department <laughs> that he was coming into. He's like, you didn't tell me. I was like, I, you know, I was going to let you get the job on your own merit. So I wasn't, trying to move the needle one way or the other. But, you yeah, know, he's an awesome guy with a great heart, um, loves serving, you know, loves doing things in the in the community and very outgoing person, right? Like, you know, you don't find people like that anymore. Very social, very engaging. Um, like everybody loves him immediately, right? Like when he moved to Florida, I think he was, you know, he was, he was you know, renting a room and wound up a part of the family, right? While he was looking for a house um, with Miss with Miss Patsy, I believe. So it's a uh, no, it's it's amazing, and just the way that you know, kind of God orchestrates those relationships and connects people together as well. Yep, sorry for the dog, and he's a good example of being intentional and staying in touch. You know, we yes. all get busy, and we all depend on, and I'm I'm raising my hand because I'm guilty as well on social media to keep us updated. 
but he's not super active on any of those, but you just get random text messages with his <laughs> travels. And he's like, I, I just had the best hamburger in this small town somewhere. And, <laughs> and so it's a good lesson for all of us just to stay connected and don't get lazy and utilize um, you know, social media to be a voyeur into other people's lives of actually be a participant in other people's lives. Yeah, no, I, that's a that's a great point. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I often say that, like, I think social media has actually made us antisocial uh, because and you just said one of my favorite words. It makes us voyeurs. Right. We just kind of peek through the windows of everybody's life. And it's, you know, we and, I, you know, traveling a lot. You're at an airport and you see so many people who are surrounded by folks, but everyone's being antisocial. Because everyone's on their phone, right? So the the days of I don't think I've had a conversation with someone on a plane who was under the age of fifty in like four years, right? Like every like if it's an older person, they don't have their device. They might have a book. They might have a Kindle. You know, you ask them what book they're reading. It starts a conversation. You talk about their grandkids, where they're traveling to. To talk to somebody my age, I'm forty one. Like no, it's like you're. It's offensive if you ask somebody where they're going, but it's because everybody's in their device, right? They get on the plane with their, with their shows downloaded, you know, like they've, they've got the script already running in their head of like what they're going to do and actually paying attention to who's around you and who God can be connecting you with. Like, that's not really a thing anymore. So I agree. Like that intentionality is important and it's easy to lose it. Right. But, uh, but like you said, Kenji's a good example of, of being, being, you know, just going through your phone every once in a while and actually reaching out to the people you genuinely have a connection with instead of just looking at their last birthday party on Facebook or Instagram. So. <laughs> yeah. And you bring up a, a, a really good point and I'll share is I had Jim Johnson, coach Jim Johnson on the show um, several episodes ago, and I encourage everybody to check it out. And Roy, you as well, because he brought up a really cool thing that he does is he sends five video messages a day. And he tries to stay consistent with it. It's hard when you think about, I need to find five people to send a message to. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you the times that I've done it, even if it's just one or two a day or one or two a week, the people that receive it, the response is overwhelmingly, man, I needed that today. That just blew me away. Thank you so much. And it was nothing to me just saying, you know what? I was thinking about you and I didn't want to send you a text and I know that you're busy but I wanted to take the time to say hello. And I mean, I've never had anybody say, why did you send that to me? I can't believe that you would send me a video. It was always out of, they were grateful and it made my day better, even if I didn't get a response. And there were some that I didn't get a response, which is okay, but it helped me show gratitude and let someone know how much I appreciate them. Yeah, no, and it's the same thing. I'll, I, you know, and I kind of, you know, I kind of allow myself to be spirit led in the same regard. But like when somebody's on my heart, like I have to reach out to them, right? Like, and even sometimes it may be prompted by what you see on social media. Like it just reminds you of that person. And it's the same thing. I won't comment on a Facebook post or an Instagram post. Like I intentionally will reach out to somebody or one of my former mentees who's an artist is like going through some stuff right now. And he posted something on his Instagram story and I text him. Right. Like I didn't comment on Instagram. I texted him and was like, you know, just gave him some encouraging words. And he was like, thank you. I really like you said, I really needed that. You don't know how much I needed that. Um, but yeah, so and, and it, it is good. Right. There is information out there, but it's really like any tool. It's how do you use it? Right. So if we just use it to look, but not to react or to be intentional about how we can help those that we have relationships with or even some that we don't. Um, then having all of this information in front of us doesn't add a lot of value, right? So it just it just kind of drives anxiety and <laughs> more frustration and, and division at the end of the day. Amen to that. So before we get into the thick of everything, and I've got tons <laughs> of things that I want to talk to you about, I like to play a game to get things warmed up. I mean, we're already warmed up pretty good, I think, <laughs> but we'll take it up to the next level. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. It's called Would You Rather. Okay. All right. So would you rather freeze time or go back in time? Hmm. How long? Like what's the time frame or it doesn't it's matter? To, it's up to you. Oh, that's hard. Um, I would probably freeze time. Right. Um, there, I mean, there, there are things I think that we all think we, we wish we could undo or that we could reverse, but at the end of the day, I've learned from all of them and benefited from them. Right. So if anything, like 
<laughs> sometimes like the, the world is kind of going squirrely. So it, it's almost like I'd rather pause because at least I know what I know. Right. So it's like it's the devil, you know, versus the devil, you don't like I don't know what's coming. I know it's already here. So if I could pause time and just and, and honestly spend more time enjoying now, I think I would value from that. But I, I've learned from everything in the past, whether good, bad or indifferent. So I wouldn't want to change any of it, to be honest. Yeah, that's great. Great perspective. And I had somebody that flipped it on me because I always thought of you would go back in time to change things or tell yourself tips yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and I had somebody share that. I want to go back in time to enjoy all the the moments that were so enjoyable that I just want to relive them. And I, I thought that is a great perspective because there are yeah. lots of things that you know, you think about your wedding day, the birth of your first child or any of your children, and it's such a blur in the moment yeah. <laughs> because there's so much going on and you're tired and um, it's busy that just to be able to go back and just, you know, just soak in that moment is something that I thought was a great perspective that I have not always had. Yeah, no, I, I, that is right, right? Like, because most of us do think about changing something when we go back, but to reflect on it and to, to kind of marinate in it, I think would be, would be a blessing as well. Yep, for sure. Okay. Would you rather, I think I know the answer to this question based on what we talked about a second ago. Would you rather live without music or TV? I actually can live without music. Oh, that's, you just completely <laughs> blew so my the, mind on that But the that funny one. thing as an artist, I can always make my own music. So, okay. right. Like, and so it's, there's always music kind of in my head anyway, and I, I don't really <laughs> record music anymore. But like I watch Seinfeld every day. So I literally could watch two television shows forever. And so which is why The Office is up here in my Funko Pops and Seinfeld is down there. Um, I could literally watch those two things all day, every day and then just read books. But with music, I could I could actually do without music. I would just listen. I would just listen to my favorite shows. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, you completely took me by surprise with that <laughs> answer. And that's why I ask these questions, because you never know. I, was, I love your Dwight Schrute behind your your shoulder, and it's <laughs> it was one of the first I would say, a, like I guess adult or grown up TV shows that my son got into in middle school. Yeah, and you know just him walking around quoting Dwight Schrute <laughs> and Michael Scott was the best. Yeah, there, there's like there's more over there. Bell Schnickel is over there, which is like my favorite Funko Pop. Uh, but yeah, it's a and the same thing. I've I've got a seven year old, a thirteen year old, and a fifteen year old. Um, and they, they all love the office and Seinfeld, uh, because, cause I watch it. Um, but it's like, yeah, my seven year old's favorite character is Kramer. He oh, absolutely loves Kramer. He thinks he's, he thinks he's hilarious. So yeah. <laughs> and they're both timeless. It's just, it's such a observational humor that it's timeless regardless of how old or how young that you are. It's just funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. I mean, re like real, real humor and real art is evergreen. Right. So that's the, the thing like it. They're they're well written shows. Right. So, um, you know, and so that's the, the reason I can just watch them over and over again, because even with Seinfeld, I probably had watched Seinfeld for 10 years before I realized that there are three stories in every show. Every show that's written, there's three distinct stories in every Seinfeld episode, and I'll be watching and realize I was focusing on one story the whole time. Like the soup Nazi episode, there are two other stories in that same episode. Um, so even in all your favorite ones, every time you watch it, I kind of like, like, oh, what was, what's the, like, and you follow the thread from one story more than the other. But the next time you watch it, now it's a different story that you're following, right? And so I learned that like years after, like reading like an article or something. And I was like, I didn't think it was true. And then the next time I went and watched an episode, I'm like, oh, there actually is. So like, that's just phenomenal creative writing. Um, and it gives you something that you can kind of keep discovering the more that you watch it. It kind of turns it into a kaleidoscope, which is pretty cool. It sounds either like a new course for you or a valuable <laughs> life lesson is that which story are you focused on today? Because there's always more stories going on behind the behind, not even behind the scenes in front of your eyes. So that's really cool. Yeah. One of my one of my sayings that I say all the time is that um is that like God writes a better story than I do. So I'm just trying not to act out of character. Right. So one of my, my best friend is a film director. Um, and so that I remember sitting with him and I executive produced one of his films and just, it was funny because I remember he said one day, he said, every character in a movie thinks they have control. 
but I wrote this, but I wrote the script. So he was like, I like everything that they think they're going to do. Like he, he was like, as that, that author, you have the full control. And he was like, that's how I feel like God is right. Like you can try to make as many turns as you want, but like, like I'm outside of the script. I'm outside of time. Like I know where you're going to turn. And ultimately I know where you're going to end up. Um, and so going through that process with him just gave me a better perspective of that story, right? And if you read Crucial Conversations, you know, we talk about the story that we tell ourselves. And so kind of putting all of that together, yeah, it came, it came to the point to where it was like, yeah, I absolutely want to, um, yeah, I absolutely want to, to live out this story, but realizing I'm not the author, right? So the best way that you do that is by staying in character, right? And, and not stepping out of like who you are and like who God made you to be. And I, you know, it's like kind of staying on that pathway, right? And then like what you get to experience and what you get to to encounter is a blessing. Uh, but it, but it's because God is the best author. So, amen to that. Okay, <laughs> so um, two more. So the next one is if you uh, actually yes, three more. So pizza or tacos? Would you rather pizza? Pizza all day. I'm a I'm a pizza snob. I've, I've worked at a pizza restaurant when I was 16 years old and I've like, like went to Italy to have pizza. So absolutely love pizza. Do you have favorite toppings? Um, just, I mean, meat. Like I, I like, I like meat on the pizza, pepperoni, you know, Italian sausage or something like that. But I've eaten, I've eaten just about every, I ate pizza as a, <laughs> I ate pizza as a vegan <laughs> with no cheese on it and just sauce and crust. So um, and some broccoli uh, years ago. So even now, my my youngest son is allergic to dairy, and pizza is one of his favorite foods. He'll eat. He, he's allergic to dairy, and he's gluten free. So we'll order him a gluten free pizza with just sauce and pepperoni and sausage, and he will devour it. Um, so yeah, I like I like a lot of the a lot of the meats, and I actually like Italian style, like the thinner pizza. Like American pizza is a bit heavy, which I love as well. But I like the the thinner kind of like. Um, you know, like brick fire or like wood oven pizza, like that thin pizza. That's really good. It doesn't sit, you know, I'm getting older, right? So it doesn't sit on you as heavy when you got less crust. So it's amazing what age will do. <laughs> we get wiser, but we can't eat as much and we have to change <laughs> exactly. what we do. We got to go to bed early, all that good stuff. Um, okay. So if you came with a warning label, what would it say? Huh? I would, it would, it should probably say warning too close causes discernment because the, as people get close to me, like there's a lot of things that you start to feel and uncover about people, uh, to where it gets to the point when people ask me for an opinion, I have to ask them if they really want my opinion, because if you've been close to me, there's a, there's a lot that I feel, there's a lot that I see that most people actually can't handle if I say it to them. So it's, um, yeah, or, or, or like, uh, or warning savage truth, right? Like that used to be the name of my podcast. It was the name of my, my second studio album. Um, I am, I am very honest, but I try to be as honest as possible in a loving way. Um, but I will never hide the truth from somebody. So people, people have to be very cautious about what they ask me if they genuinely want an answer. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a really good thing. And a lesson for all of us to hear is, are you willing to even provide yourself with the savage truth? And yeah. I know for most of my life, I was, even though I knew what I, I was thinking about myself, I would never admit it. And it wasn't until that I admitted all the things I had tried to hide from myself, which is silly to think that you can hide something from yourself <laughs> is when I really stepped into you know, like you said earlier, like who God made me to be and who was that character. So I knew if I was acting out of character or in character, because I finally revealed that to myself. And it gave me a lot of strength and comfort to finally just, just shed all of that stuff and to stare at myself in the mirror and just tell myself who I was. Yeah. And that's, and, and again, I think they're, um, yeah, from an honesty perspective, like when you, when you, start telling yourself the truth it's hard to lie to other people right like when i'm like even in my book i, t I talk about authenticity and so like when you're authentic it's hard to not encourage other people to be authentic and it's hard to not notice inauthenticity because you did it for so long like a lot of us are, are inauthentic in different places right we act different at church than we do at work 
We act different around our friends than we do around our wife's friends. You know, we act different around our parents. And then when you start to break all of that stuff down, you start noticing the facades that people wear in different places, right? And then you have, and I mean, and it doesn't even give you a sense of frustration. It gives you a level of empathy that like, I understand why you're hiding that part of yourself, but like, let me, let me help you, you know, kind of learn how to be fully authentic and express yourself so that people can love and know the genuine you, right? Because, and, and it goes back to self, like, when we learn to genuinely love ourselves, then we stop trying to, hard, to hide parts of ourselves from other people um, as well. So I, I think that is, that's absolutely true, but it does start with you um, and, and kind of uncovering that authentic version of yourself and being able to look in the mirror and just be honest uh, because we can't offer to people genuinely what we don't have. Yes, and on the same token is also being truthful of, of telling yourself who you want to be. So we so often will beat ourselves up and get into that negative loop of I'm not good enough. I can't believe that this is who I am. And then that spins into negativity and, and really a lot of unrest. And you can program yourself to tell yourself who you want to be and how you want to show up. And over time, you will program yourself to become that person. Yes. And but you have to repeat it. You've got to stare at yourself in the mirror. And whether you believe it yet or not, the more you tell yourself the good things, then you'll start to believe it. Yeah. And like, and I, I, I probably posted a video within the last couple of weeks, I do a leadership tip every day. And that's one of the things I said, the hardest thing for us to overcome, I call it the negative soundtrack in our own mind, right? Because when that changes, like when you stop basically beating yourself up all day and you have a, and you have a new positive affirming message in your mind, that's reminding you of who you can be, who God calls you to be, what your purpose is, then it completely transforms the way that the way that you function, right? Which is, and again, that's why like in the book, I actually focus most of it on that, right? Like fix yourself. There's all these books about fixing your employees and fixing your business and fixing your customer. If you fix yourself, all of those other things will follow. Um, and I think that's what we need to be able to, to love ourselves. We need to be honest with ourselves. We have to have empathy for ourselves as well right because like you said most of us you know present something throughout life on a daily basis that we know isn't true right um and we and we actually hide the worst parts of ourselves from ourselves which is a ridiculous notion but we do it all the time like we don't you know we don't know we're cheating on our diet we don't know that we're lying on our taxes we don't know that we're not showing up we're not giving 100 percent. we absolutely know right so if we if we can't be honest with ourselves, then it, it's it's very, very unlikely that we're going to be honest with someone else. Oh, I was muted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I totally agree with everything that you said, um, and it's it's important. So we've gone 20 minutes, and I know that I'm going to have an introduction bumper at the very <laughs> beginning that tells everybody who you are. Uh, but everybody, I'm joined with uh, Roy Dockery, and he wrote The Art of Leading truth, love, and empathy in action. I absolutely adore the, the title. And then on his LinkedIn, he talks about that he's a problem advisor and a trans, transformation initiator. And those are great. And when I was reading on your webpage, you talked about characterized by resilience, faith, and determination has led him to inspire change. And to give you, you know, hopefully we're bringing in people that are new to the show. And I started Pathways to Greatness for a lot of the same reasons of, of the things that dis you describe yourself as or as other people have described you. And I started in 2023 primarily because, one, I wanted to hear other people's stories. And two, I want to express the fact that everybody has a different pathway to greatness. Everybody has a different definition of greatness. And I want to bring people on like yourself to help others learn strategies and tactics and hear your stories of how you're on your pathway to greatness and what that looks like. And then also, I just want to encourage people to not quit. It's so easy. I was, I grew up as a habitual quitter. If anything got difficult, I quit. And it's so important in life just to continue to push through and find, find that next thing and say, okay, I just need to make it to the end of the day today. And then every day, just say, I just need to make it to the end of the day today. And if you, the more you do that, then it's not that, that dire straits of here's where you're at and this is where I need to be. So 
all that being said, Roy, so what is your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness would be using every gift that God has given you to make the impact on the world that you think you're created for. Right. So it's it's bringing everything you have to the table and making an impact. And so that that that's going to look uniquely different from every person because the what you're bringing to the table is different. Um, but also what's in your heart to kind of fix, right? Like there, like we all see something broken in the world. And I think greatness is when we put everything that we have into trying to fix that thing. Um, and yeah, and, and whatever, whatever that looks like for a person, um, I think that's, I think it's different, but I, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of generic ideas of, of greatness or success or influence or whatever that are that are vanity metrics that that don't matter right some of the most influential impactful people that i know don't even have a social media page right and i think you know some of the wealthiest people i know don't have a social media page right and you wouldn't know who they were right but they can write checks for millions of dollars uh, to 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 move causes that they're passionate about or to do things in in foreign countries that that god feels like they've called them to so that's what I think it is, right? It's just a, like you are, we are uniquely and wonderfully made, which means that you have a unique purpose and greatness is walking in that purpose with everything you have. Man, that's awesome. So, and, and, and again, in this world of social media, of people wanting to have the most followers and, and having all these things that the world shows and looks at as being successful. And I liked your, your definition because everybody says you have to have social media. You don't have to have social media to be successful. You have to impact people's lives in a positive way. So I know through conversations with other people and even conversations that I've had with myself, you talk about using every gift you have. And so many people struggle to even know what that looks like. Like, what are my gifts? How do I, like, what am I good at? And some people just don't know what they're good at. And I'm curious like when you're talking to somebody and you hear that statement, how do you help people audit who they are to find the gifts that they can use to impact the world? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something like, I'm, you know, one thing that I mentor people around the world, right, and have for have for years. And one of the things that I that I often find is that we try to evaluate our gifts based on what other people value. Right. So like if 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 I can do something, but somebody else doesn't value it the way that I think something substantial should be valued, then I don't see it as a gift. Right. Like you. So um, to me, a gift are the things that come naturally to you that that give you a sense of purpose, but don't exhaust you. Because if it's a gift that comes from God, then like God will refill you when you use it. Right. There's a lot of things we can be trained to do that will drain us, that will exhaust us, that will deplete us um, because it's not coming from an everlasting source. Right. So it's, it's coming from sheer willpower. It's coming from whatever. But like when God has gifted you to do something like you can do it and you might get tired. Right. Like you might run out of energy, but you'll never be exhausted. Um, and so that's what I kind of tell people to focus on. It's not because your gift may not be the thing that makes you the most money. Your gift may not be the thing that gets you the most attention or that gets you the most applause or the most accolade, but it into your, what you just said previously, it has an impact, right? So it's, what are the things that you can naturally do that have an impact? Like, that's how I would define a gift. It doesn't matter the measure of the impact. It doesn't matter the magnitude of the impact, whether it's an impression or a crater, it doesn't matter because all of those things, uh, all of those things matter. Um, because even if you think like when you think about people who are gifted to do hospitality, but on in a one on one setting, they're not charismatic, gifted public speakers. But right, like if I'm in a hospital <laughs> and I need somebody to talk to me, I don't want the charismatic speaker that's trying to tell a joke. I want somebody who can connect with me on a human level that can discern how I feel and know how to deliver that. That person will never get graded as somebody, right? That is like this great people person or have this large audience, but the individual impact that they have every day with every patient that they speak to, with every family member they engage with has eternal consequences, 
right? And has like eternal impact. So I think that's the thing. And because of all of these metrics, I think we downplay our gifts because they can't be measured the way that everything else is measured. Like how do you measure hospitality, right? Hospitality isn't gonna draw crowds, <laughs> but it's gonna keep your house filled with people who love you and who feel the love of God in you, right? So which maybe two people here, three people here, but you're not packing out an arena. Um, but it, but to me, it's just as significant because we all play different roles. Yes. And what, what you said is I, what I really like, and I hope the listeners heard everything. And I say this often in, in, in the show is if you have to rewind, rewind or <laughs> re-listen to the whole thing, because what Roy shared was, is that your impact can't always be measured. And I would even challenge that most of it will never be measured. And even if it could be measured by what by what society says is successful, doesn't mean that the one person that you impacted will impact someone else that will impact someone else that will ultimately create something that, according to society, changes the world. And you won't ever know. There was a great I don't know if you probably have because it sounds like you're well read and listened to is Ed Milet. He was talking about. Um, he's a, a great podcaster. If you haven't listened to it, you should. Okay. And he talks about in his book, um, like just one more. And he talked about how his dad was an alcoholic and some random person at some random point in his life convinced him, his dad to get clean. And that guy will never know who he was, but his dad getting clean impacted him, which put him on a path of, self-discovery and self-development to where he he's like worth probably five, six hundred million dollars. He's a huge podcaster, written several books that that gentleman in that that one bar, I think it was that set his dad on the course of getting clean and sober for the rest of his life changed everything. And that guy will never know who he was and the impact that he's making on millions of lives because of what he did for the one person. And it's a yeah, great and it's yeah, and it's the same thing, right? Some some plant, some water, some get the witness to growth, and like you don't get either one. And I'll just tell a story real quick. I, I did music and you know, I still kind of dip dabble in music a little bit for over 20 years. When we lived in Colorado, I lived in Colorado for two years, right? So for one, Kenji is is from that experience in Colorado, which is why we're on the phone. But one of the craziest things that happened is I got a message on Instagram or it might have been Facebook, but I got a direct message from one of the people who works in the box office at a at a club, like a secular bar slash nightclub that we did an event at as Christian artists who said this person just came and told me to find you and reach out to you because when they came to your con or when when the show that you performed at. They were actually traveling through Colorado with a cult, and they had been kidnapped and just kind of like stayed with the cult, right? And they kept them drugged, kept them, um, kept them intoxicated, and all that other stuff. And them hearing us testify about Jesus, because we were the only Christian group at a secular event. He said the guy left with that group, but then wound up finding his way back to Colorado just to go back to that nightclub and like now lives in Denver, Colorado, gave his life to Christ, all that other stuff. Now, I don't even know who this person is. I don't know what their name is, but I'm sure that God will use them to do things. And it's even, I really appreciate even when God allows me to see some of the growth in, because I don't, I don't, I, he doesn't owe me that and I don't deserve it, right? Like I'm trying to be obedient, but there are those opportunities where God will show you Kind of like you did this then and this is the repercussion now, right? Whether it's in our, our personal decisions or the impact that we've had. So you never know. And, and again, like I'm, no one knows who I am as an artist, right? But even, even if that, that impact of being able to get somebody out of a cult that probably would have led to that person's death or, or just a, a horrible lifestyle for them to be delivered from that was worth every song, every minute in a studio, every dollar that I spent promoting. Right. Like it was worth it. Right. Because I believe that everything that we do is just so souls can be saved and heaven can rejoice. So like that's enough for me in that one thing. And I thank God that I even I got to know that. And there, there are other stories that I've seen, you know, that I've, that we've seen and we've been able to benefit um, as well. But you absolutely don't know where that connection is going to happen. So it's it's really good to show up and be intentional in everything that you do. Yeah, it's compounding. 
It's just one leads to two to three to four. And we don't know when that pivotal tipping point is of, of when we're going to find that. If you just continue, like you said earlier, continuing the gifts that you have is at some point you may be able to provide for your family in your gift. It doesn't always mean that you can. And I think that's where people get confused sometimes is, well, my purpose, this is my purpose. I'm trying to do that. But that not might not be the way that you am, are able to support your family. It's still your purpose and it's something that you need to do. We hope that it is. And it's something that's that's really important. And then it's putting you in that place. I had a friend that really wanted to work with men and he, you know, had his his tragic past and a lot of the things that he's had and how he's been able to, um, you know, through Christ redeem himself. And he wanted to set off on this course of coaching men and was really going through it. We were having a lot of really good conversations. And then all of a sudden he gets a job with the local fire department. <laughs> and, and he was like, well, I'm not going to be able to, you know, do the coaching anymore because I need to provide for my family. It's like, dude, you're going into an environment with, first responders that are challenged on a daily basis with a lot of the things that you're talking about with this, you know, masculinity of not sharing your problems, your concerns. I'm like, he just puts you behind the front lines <laughs> yes. of where you need to be. It doesn't look like you wanted it to be to where you're virtually coaching men and building a community like that may come I'm like, dude, you are in it now. And I, I yeah. feel that he, showed you what you wanted to do and what he wants you to do. But now he puts you where he needs you and where maybe it's just one firefighter in the department that needs him of why he's there when he's there. And it's just a, when you shared that story, it's such a critical thing that we have to, like you said earlier with Seinfeld, we have to make sure we're looking at the right story or being aware that we may be looking at this story, but God's got more than three going on in the background that we have to be aware of. Absolutely. And that, and and then they and then they all merge at like a point of significance, right? And that's the thing because when you when you talk about that like the current role that I have, so I left my last company in April, um where which is where Kenji is and the current job that I have is from a TikTok video that I posted because of what God told me to share. Right. So I literally and I'm like, I'm going through like financially set, don't really have to worry about anything. I'm like, God, I'm fine with not working. Family's taken care of. Everything's good. I do consulting. I've got the book. I'm traveling around the world like it's fine. But then like what he placed on my heart was like and I was actually on my way to go visit a trade, a prison that had got converted into a trade school. And so I have a passion for evangelizing the field service industry. Right. I think it's a great industry. The jobs pay well. There's a lot of opportunities for people with high school diplomas that don't go to college. Right. It's a lot of upward mobility for families. It's great for Gen Z because no one wants to work in an office anymore. Everybody wants to get out. And so I made a TikTok video that morning before me and one of our executive pastors went to the, the prison. And then I posted it on, you know, I posted it on TikTok. I put it on my LinkedIn page. And literally later that afternoon, someone was like, do you realize we just posted a job? for somebody to create content, do research and, and like kind of broadly, like kind of impact the field service industry. So, right. Like I went from being a field service executive, I was interviewing for COO roles, right. Cause that's the logical progression from being a senior executive to go to the C-suite. But I literally told God, I'm like, this feels weird. When you talk about a pathway, I said, I'm, and I, I literally prayed, I said, God, this logically makes sense. But if this isn't the way you want me to go, please show me the other way, right? And I was literally filling out applications and feeling convicted that like, this isn't the way I want you to go. So I just stopped applying for jobs. And I was like, all right, God, I guess you're just gonna deliver it to me because uh, logically it makes sense, right? 10 years in, in an industry, 10 years as an executive, I should keep going in this direction. And that would benefit me the most individually, right? Like COO roles um, pay significantly but I've made a lot of money for a long time, right? Like more money doesn't really <laughs> make a difference to me. Um, but yeah, so, but creating, but God created that opportunity where it was like, this is what I want you to do, right? I want you to to be able to um, to share and to create content. And like, now that literally is my full-time job, right? So just the irony of like, but it's but it's to that whole thing. It's surrendering that story. Like, God, this makes sense to me, but you are so much smarter than me. You are so much, 
you are you're significantly more creative than me. So whatever you want to write, and like I said earlier, let me just stay in character and then, you know, feed me the next line, right? It's like looking at the teleprompter, like feed me the next line. And I literally did that. It was on a Friday morning. I made a post. And by that Tuesday, I was talking to an executive at an industry association about becoming the research developer for field service um, from an industry perspective. And that's my, that's my full-time job now is to make content, do research and talk about field service to the world. Right. So, and it's kind of like, I would have never thought about that. I didn't even think that job existed. Right. But it was, he put it on my heart and then it literally like popped up in my inbox on LinkedIn. So. Yeah, that is, it's awesome. And I have a similar story and we can talk about it on the side because every all, the listeners have all heard it, <laughs> but I also want to add to is that, that sometimes God has to take you through the desert. Like you may make that decision. You may pray and you may feel that conviction that this isn't the direction you want to go. This is the direction that I think he wants you that he wants me to go. And then you go that direction. It may not happen as, as wonderfully as it did for Roy and no stay in that search seeking mode and that obedience mode and try to find out because God's got you in that place for a reason. He's got you where he has you and you, it, it requires you to have the wisdom and the, the curiosity to keep digging and be persistent and resilient to, to wait for that time that he's ready. And I had a mentor say is stay in it until God releases you from it. And yeah. <laughs> you may not like where you're at, but just be diligent, stay in it. Be like Roy said is continue to live your purpose and God will reveal what's next for you. And what next for you may be is you need to be right there for your family. That's why he doesn't need you in a job that's busy. There's a lot of things that you can dig through. Yeah. And the one thing I'll add to that as well, just so people understand, like this was a four month period of me being unemployed and I haven't been unemployed since I was 16 years old. So it was a desert time for me, right? Like I've woken up with the purpose with, cause that, I mean, at times I, at one time I had a record label, a nonprofit, and I was a corporate executive. So not only have I had one job, I've always had like two or three businesses that I was running at all times. And so, and then, you know, my, my wife is a stay at home mom. My family has one income. Um, I also take care of my mother um, and I have an adopted adult daughter. Right. And then I, and my oldest biological daughter was starting college in August. So to say that there was a lot going on to be like, all right, God, <laughs> like, there was moments when I'm like, it's June, like, you know, she's got orientation in a couple of weeks and I've got to, and so, and it's weird for me, right? It's weird for me not to have income. It's weird for me not to, to, to kind of have that re- reliable um, source of a high income, which I've, which I've had for a while, but, um, but it was just being prayerful, being intentional and being like, all right. And, and just knowing, right? Like, God, I want to keep applying for these jobs. But then to your point, I would, I probably would have gotten some of them. And then I would have been in a role that I probably wouldn't have liked going down a path that I wouldn't have enjoyed. So there were there were a lot of <laughs> there were a lot of touchy moments there where I had to be like and I, you know, and I thank God for my wife who's like, I trust you to trust him. Right. So my wife wasn't like, where are you applying today? Like, what's going on? You know, she stopped because my wife's real, my wife loves doing research. Right. So but when I told her I felt that conviction, she stopped sending me jobs. Right. Because she was looking them up when she had free time as well. And like, oh, look at this role. Look at that role. But um, but no, it, it is you know, it, it is difficult. And it's like you just got to focus on the main things and then trust God. Right. So it's like I, that's what I did. I focused on what are their primary things in front of me, being prayerful about it, managing our resources. Right. Um, you know, like I said, and then during that time, I got like consulting engagements here. This did that. So it kind of filled the holes like during that, um, during that time period. Um, but it was just, it was just trusting him and saying like, I'm not going to take it into my own hands, even though I want to, it's like, I've, I've got to trust you because you know, best. Amen. I'm on year three, by the way, (laughs) four months, four months would have been nice. I'm on year three on this adventure that he's got me on, but he's provided and it's been absolutely wonderful. It's been brutal sometimes, some days, but overall it's been beautiful. And like you said, is having having a supportive wife that chooses to go through this with you is it's so important just to have, that's why you have to be equally yoked. You have to be with the person that 
is like you said, that trust you to trust him. And that shows their trust in him is that, Absolutely. that you've got that faith. So Roy, I want to be sensitive of your time, but I want to go over two topics and because you, you talk about these on your YouTube channel. And so I encourage everybody, I will have everything in the show notes, but go to Roy Dockery.org because there's, there's great information there. And then he's got links to all of his um, socials and click on the YouTube because he's got valuable free information that he has on his YouTube channel that they're not long videos. They're all between what 12 and 15 minutes, I believe. Yeah. Um, and they're just really, really good. And as you can tell, he speaks well, he's engaging. And so there were two, two topics of videos that, that I want to ask you about. The first one is around empathetic leadership. And it's, it's something that the, I would say the majority of leaders don't possess empathy. They forget where they came from. And yeah. all of a sudden they get the title on their business card. They may get the cool office. And then now they start to rule with the uh, iron fist and they don't remember what it was like to be ruled that way. So talk to us a little bit about not just the professional importance of empathy, but the personal importance of empathy in parenting and friendship and, you know, all those different elements that, that empathy really is critical in. Yeah, I think, um, and it, empathy is one of my favorite topics. And if I could simplify it, I think empathy is just selflessness, right? Like when we think about empathy, I think we try to overcomplicate it, right? Because in what I tell my mentees, my employees, people that I've managed over time, don't assume, right? Like don't assume that what you want somebody to do is the most important thing in their life today. So like just assume that somebody could be going through something and it's impacting the way that they respond. So because selfishly, when I go to Walmart, I want the cashier to be in a good mood to serve me, right? Selfishly, when I go to work, I want the receptionist to be in a good mood so that they don't disrupt my vibes. But what if that cashier right before they came to work got to notice that someone in their family was critically ill, but they don't have enough money? to take the time off to not go to work or they don't have a policy that allows them bereavement, right? Like wait, when you start like being in a leadership role, you start realizing that there's so much complexity to every person that you should just stop assuming that people owe you the best experience, right? So like if you model that, so if you're the person who walks into Starbucks or Walmart with a happy disposition, cause you should be a light cause that's what Christ called us to do anyway, Right. But I remember um, me and my wife were talking one time and I'm like, my entire experience with interacting with people in public changed when I made the conscious decision to project Christ over anything else. So what I want anyone to see when I encounter them is the fact that I love Jesus and he loves you. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how your day is going. It doesn't matter if you're rude. It doesn't matter if you cut me off in traffic. It doesn't matter if you cut me off, you know, cut in front of me in line at united when i'm waiting on an airplane all of this little stuff that used to bother me i realized that like a lot of people can just be going through stuff so i think when people position it that way it's easier to be empathetic because we can all think about when we had a bad day and it came across to someone else that we were being short or rude or condescending or uncaring but they didn't know what was going on in our mind they didn't know what was going on in our life, right? Like I've, I've walked in the house after losing my job. And the first thing my wife did was tell, was say a joke. Right. And I'm like, I walk in the house and I'm like, I'm in a bad mood. Like I just, you know, the, the military just kicked me out. Like, this is a true story. First thing I did when I walked in the house is my wife said a joke from a Kevin Hart stand up, and it was hilarious. Right. And I, and I had to pause in that moment and just laugh because that's who she always is. And I'm always responding. So it would have been weird to her for me to be upset about her making a joke when she, we always make jokes. That's like our love language is humor, right? But I think that's the main thing. Like we've gotta be selfless and stop expecting everybody to make our day better, right? And then we should set out to try to add light and to try to add levity into other people's lives because you don't know what they're going through. And that applies, like you said, in every sphere of life. If I'm an employer, if I'm a customer, if I'm the leader, if I'm the coach, if I'm the person on the team, it doesn't matter, right? Like just understand that you can actually do something to make someone's day better. 
and you shouldn't expect that from everybody else because you don't know what they're going through. Well said. It's the one time <laughs> that assuming is important. <laughs> yeah, we always say don't assume, and this is one time that that it is. And <clears throat> just as a reminder to everybody of what he said is, don't forget the bad days that you've had and how you want to show up for other people. And I really like also what you said is to show up to show the light of Christ. And if you do that and you be the good neighbor, we're commanded to be the good neighbor. That doesn't mean waiting for someone else to be the good neighbor first. We need to be that example. We need to be, well, why are you always so happy? Well, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'll tell you, you got a few minutes. I'll tell you. Yeah. And it's funny. Cause I, I have a song on one of my last albums. That's actually called I'm a Christian. So one of the, one of the shirts that we used to sell at concerts just said, I'm a Christian. And so I would be traveling. And then after a while, I started to realize that like, and like I said, I have to project myself a certain way. Cause I'm wearing a shirt. That says, I'm with Jesus. So if I'm with Jesus, can I be the rude person at the airport? Like, can I be the the condescending person on a Zoom call? Because I wore it at work. I wore it at the airport. And that kind of helped me because it's like I'm wearing, it's not just a cross that I can tuck into my shirt. Like, it's literally blazoned across my chest that I'm a Christian. And so it started, but then people would turn around and they would smile and they say, I'm a Christian too. Thank you for being a light. And it was it was really encouraging to see that like you do get a different response based on what you choose to project. And that's a choice that we get to make every day. Every time we step out of our house, every time we wake up, we get to choose what we represent from the clothes that we wear to the expression on our face um, and the way that we interact with folks in public. Yeah, that's your t-shirt. You don't need a t-shirt to be that way. And a t-shirt is a great reminder and to say is, okay, if I'm wearing, because I have a shirt that says Christ alone. And so if I'm wearing that, you really start to second guess how you're going to react, how you're going to show up. And so the challenge that, that Roy and I are, are issuing to you is regardless of what shirt you're wearing, are you projecting who you are and who you want to be known for? And that's important. That's really, really important. So the second topic that you have on there and you guys, I'm telling you, just go on there and watch the videos. The second one is leadership in a crisis. And it's taking responsibility of failure. This is something the world fails at miserably <laughs> on a regular basis. And you look at, I was rereading and going through Genesis 1, and you, you're reading about Adam, how he didn't even take responsibility. I mean, he was the first one to throw Eve under the bus. As soon as God's like, did you eat the apple? She made me do it. Like yeah. immediately, like she made me do it. And so it's, it's in our nature to protect ourselves and to blame others. So when you're looking at leadership in a crisis and taking responsibility of failure, what are some, some good suggestions that you can have for people to, to do this gracefully? Yeah, I think, you know, it, and even, in, even in the military, right, you have this whole thing of like you, you recognize publicly and then like you, you challenge or you chastise in private. Um, like in the Navy anyway, right? I know a lot of other forces, they yell at everybody, but like when your battalion or when your group is together out publicly, like you're solid, you're clean. But then when we get back to the barracks, like you're going to get tortured, right? If you did something wrong. Um, but so when I came out of the military and went into like regular civilian life after that, like whenever I had an opportunity, like when something went wrong, right? It's just my propensity. I don't, you know, as a leader to say that was my fault. Because I ask people all the time, as a leader, if you are the person ultimately responsible, then everything is your fault. So I think that's where you start with accountability, um, because if you're the leader and you did the hiring and you did the training and you're responsible for the firing, everyone's performance underneath your control is your responsibility, right? So even if, even if John isn't doing their job managing Susie, then you're responsible for John, who's responsible for Susie, so you're still ultimately responsible for Susie. So it's, um, for me, it's, it's saying we when we succeed, and it's saying I when we fail, right? So we succeeded, but I fail. Because when it comes to what's needed to be done on a team to get to an outcome, the person at the top is never doing that work. So you can, you, you, you would unjustly take credit for it anyway, right? I've run global service organizations. I've got people fixing problems on three continents. I can't raise my hand and say, 
I fix Duke University, Stanford Medical Center, Yale New Haven Hospital, Humber River in Canada, and you know, and St. Alphonsus in you know in Europe somewhere. I can't say that. It would be a lie, even though leaders do do it. Um, but I think from an accountability perspective, it's we succeed, but I fail, and then I've got to work with my organization to figure out what I need to do to support them. Right. So what in supporting sometimes is they need to go. Right. That's one of the videos. Um and creating an opportunity for them to be successful somewhere else. But I think that's what we need to we need to own, right? Like if you are ultimately responsible, if you get paid the most money, <laughs> right, and you're at the top of the totem pole, you're there for a reason, right? So when when there's a failure, when there's a crisis, like you need to take responsibility. You need to be the 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 person who's steady in the storm, right? Like that that's you know that you're 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 even killed you're not anxious right like that's what people need to see when you're leading by an example and it's not because it's not difficult it's because i believe that the team that i have the resources that we have that will get through it right like it doesn't mean that we're not it's not going to be difficult doesn't mean we're not going to fail and that we're going to fall down but we will support each other and as long as you're trying your best we're not failing Right. Like we are not collectively failing as long as everybody's trying their best. We may not hit a goal. We may not hit a target. Um, but at the end of the day, like as the leader, you're accountable for bringing the best out of every person. And if you can't do that because they're not a good fit, then you're responsible for helping that person find another opportunity. Um, but, yeah, it's we succeed, but I fail. Right. Like as a leader, when we didn't hit a target, I stood in C-suite meetings and said, I I missed that. I'll take responsibility for that. It was never this person didn't do that or this person didn't do it because it, it's it's weakness anyway. At the end of the day, no one really cares, right? Like it's it's under your purview. You just minimize your own value by doing that. Um, but we've been taught to point fingers instead of looking in the mirror, taking accountability, and then doing everything that we can to equip our teams to be to be better. And sometimes that again, that equipping is by removing people um, that that are struggling with being successful or who don't want to show up and put in the effort to be successful and replacing them with people who appreciate and will, and will be all in on the opportunity. Yeah. And what you had shared also earlier about being authentic is if you're leading that way, you're going to start to see your team react the same way. They start taking ownership. They start being honest, not blaming, not coming up with excuses. It was just like, you know what? I fell short. And that's breeding a really positive culture that's going to see more success because now Absolutely. everybody's working together. They're going to raise their hand quicker to know that, well, if I don't know what I, I need to know, I need to ask before I fail and have to say that I failed versus I'll just try to figure it out because I'm afraid if I tell Roy that I don't know what I'm doing, he's going to come at me and ask me, why don't you know what you 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 need to do? You should know that by now. You know, there's a lot of things that, that will come out of that in a positive manner. Yeah, because one of the one of the other things, and there's a video on transparency as well in that series. So the 13 videos that are on my YouTube actually match the 13 chapters of the book as well. Um, so that is one of the that's one of the the key things. So that vulnerability and that transparency, when you model it as a leader and you say, I messed up, the people who know that you didn't actually mess up will start raising their hand before that and saying, hey, like we're going in the wrong direction because they respect the fact that you you fell on the sword. They're not they don't want to see you do that again. Right. So they're going to start raising their hands and saying, like, hey, we all failed and we didn't actually let him know we were going off of that cliff and he still took an L for us. So now let's say, hey, like we need to slow down. We need to pump our brakes because the thing is, most people think the leader is afraid of delivering bad news. So everyone hides it from the leader. But if you're the leader and stand up and say, not only do I have bad news, but I'm taking full responsibility for it, you then model for the rest of the team that when you, it's kind of like the, what came out after 9-11, right? If you see something, say something, right? Like if we're, if we're falling off a cliff, tell me. If we're, if we're trending in the wrong direction, tell me. If this process doesn't make any sense, tell me. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to own whether we succeed or fail or not. But like, I want you to know that you can bring that to me and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to hold it against you that you bring up something that, you know, that kind of skews where we're trying to go or what we expect to be happening. 
Well, Roy, great, great stuff. I could sit here and talk for another hour, but I know that uh, <laughs> you don't have another hour to, to give me, and we'll have to do maybe round two at some point in the future. But what would you like to leave the audience with today? Um, kind of what we talked about already. I, I think today, you know, regardless of what you wear, right, like try to project Christ, right? And even if someone's not a believer, I know everybody that listens to podcasts isn't, but like Jesus, whether you believe he's the son of God or not, like from his reputation <laughs> was still a pretty cool guy, right? And he was, he was, uh, he was self-sacrificing. He was loving, right? He, he did for the least of those that were around him. So even if you just project like a Christ-like character and remember that people are going through things, right? Give them the grace that you would want somebody to give you when you were having a bad day. Um, and I think, first of all, your life just gets easier, right? Because you stop carrying this anxious burden of, of trying to, you know, of wanting everything to be, to be fine. Um, and it's easy to be consistent, right? Like when you'd wake up every day and decide to be something, when you decide to project something, it becomes easier every day that you do it. Right. And then it just becomes natural to where I am somebody that would that used to be one of the most aggressive, almost violent drivers. And my wife's known me since I was 16 years old. She cracks up now because I let everybody in. Right. I'm just like, get over. I'm waving people. I'm flashing. Horn. And it doesn't bother me anymore because, like, I've been doing it consistently for so long. And because, you know what I thought one day? I said, what if this person's trying to cut in traffic right now because they're trying to get to the hospital because they just found out their child was sick? Now that's the way I think about everybody cutting into traffic because it doesn't matter. Because even if it's not true, what if it is? Right? What if, and what if you letting them in, um, and, I, and I even told my wife, what if that person's angry and trying to get somewhere to do something to harm somebody? And then every person that flips the finger at them, that blows a horn at them, just escalates their anger, right, over and over and over again. So at least if I can give them a little bit of peace and free them up and let them go, maybe they'll calm down by the time they get where they're going. And I'm not escalating somebody that could be on the way to do something harmful, right? So it's just little things like that, that if you're constantly thinking that way, it reshapes the way that you interact with the world. And it just, it gives you a greater sense of peace. And then honestly, for the people that you encounter, they get to they get to experience that grace. That's what we all that we, what is a, was what we we all get from God anyway, right? So hopefully, even in passing, they see that, and then you're planting a seed that grace is sufficient for you, and then at some point they'll find the ultimate grace, which is Christ's sacrifice. So those are great parting words. <laughs> so, so Roy, how can people if they want to follow you and find you? What are the best ways that they can do that? Yeah, like you said, they can go to RoyDockery.org. Um, you know, I'm Roy Dockery on LinkedIn, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and Instagram as well. Uh, if you just type, you know, look for Roy Dockery MBA. Uh, but the best place is RoyDockery.org. Our merchandise is on there. The signed copy of the book is on there. Digital copy of the book is on there. And yeah, if anyone wants to order my book, please order it off my website because Amazon takes 70%. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, or between Amazon and my publisher. So yeah, but um, but yeah, everything's on RoyDockery.org. Nope, that's awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, Roy Dockery. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on the Pathways to Greatness podcast. We hope that today's conversation inspired you to take steps towards your own greatness. Remember, every journey starts with a single step. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with someone who might benefit. Actually, share it with three people that you might think it might benefit. Until next time, keep pursuing your passions and carving your own path to greatness. Take care.